Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's good. It's a good cue from Mike there. Um, so actually, this is a preview of a talk that I'm giving tomorrow, I believe, at 1.30. Um, that'll be a full-length session. This is just a quick lightning talk um, on how we do real-time media in cloud native. So quickly run through, you know, why do we want to do this? What are the benefits of it? And give you some use cases. Given this is lightning, I may not get, to, well, I won't get to the demo. I can guarantee that. But I will tomorrow. I can guarantee that as well. Um, so the challenge we have is that um, the world of development is moving towards cloud native and Kubernetes. So do any of you here, if you come across Kubernetes, work with it at all? No. So it's, um, it's basically an, an infrastructure for orchestrating cloud native workloads that run as containers on top of physical or virtual machines. The challenge is that that world has very much focused on web applications. So for example, if you want to check if a Kubernetes workload is running, you either send it a TCP handshake or you send it an HTTP GET. You know, those are the options. Um, but if you look at the world of applications as a whole, you can divide it into kind of a two by two taxonomy, as most things divide. So you have the kind of non-real time and real time different requirements. But then also in terms of semantics, you have stuff that's interactive kind of request response, so synchronous. And you have streaming, so the asynchronous publish and subscribe. And I would contend that web apps are very much in that top left corner. We have a whole bunch of other requirements. So for example, message buses, such as Kafka. Um, in fact, we do have some integration of that, which is on our booth over in the world of solutions, um, which we have in our Callisti product. Um, but by default, Kubernetes really doesn't handle this well. Um, but real-time apps, not at all. Um, and there are two kind of types of real-time app you might be interested in. Could be things like online gaming that are interactive, or it could be, for example, if you were watching this over the internet and you didn't want to lag, it could be live media. And that's why I've said it's kind of fuzzy, this taxonomy, because you know, how real-time is real-time, as an example. You know, analog TV, when I was growing up, they literally counted up the seconds to the hour. Nowadays, it's a bit more non-deterministic with digital. But if I'm watching on my cable TV subscription and my friend's watching over the top on the internet, I'd better not tell him somebody just scored, because he hasn't seen it yet. Now, we know we can do real time on the internet because we have WebEx and Zoom, et cetera. So the question is, can we make that easily deployable, scalable, drop the cost, and have it so that when I watch the football, I don't have to worry about that? So we're looking at real time, but particularly, I want to focus on live media today, which is what this project does. So, the project's called Media Streaming Mesh, and it's really an open source project trying to address this in Kubernetes. So if I come today and I say, I've got some media, I want to put it on Kubernetes, what are my options? So using service meshes, which are very popular in Kubernetes, the problem is they, they'll handle TCP. They're brilliant for web apps because they can do URL routing. You can say, you know, cisco.com slash customer go this way, cisco.com slash product go that way. So it does all that sort of thing. It can check your websites are up. Um, but it doesn't handle UDP, and it certainly doesn't handle real-time media. And the other approach normally in Kubernetes is to use NAT, so Kube proxy and node port and NAT. That's OK for these other services, though not great, because, for example, when you expose something externally, you end up exposing it on a high port number, not the well-known port number. So not ideal. Um, but they don't support real-time at all. The reason there is these protocols, such as RTSP and SIP, what they tend to do is have a control channel. On that control channel, you'll negotiate the ports that you're going to use for your data channel. And of course, if you're using that, you can't see that. So you've got to have a proxy. One approach that I've seen used very successfully is host networking. So you run your workload in the host namespace. And that solves all these problems. So, so why am I even talking? Well, it solves them for one workload on each node which isn't so scalable. If you're running on virtual machines, maybe you can scale your VM down to fit one workload. But you're still orchestrating a vast number of virtual machines then. And certainly, if you're running bare metal, you want to be able to run multiple. And so that's what we're talking about with Media Streaming Mesh. Um, very much aimed at real time, but we can also proxy at lower layers. So what, why do it? Other than just to make things work, what are the other benefits? And I think the two things that you see in the service mesh world, which I think you're going to want for everything, are observability and security. So again, if you come and see our demos over in the world of solutions on Callisti and Panoptica, we're talking about observability and security. So how do I see what's going on in my network? How can I spot things like packet loss and jitter, which matter for real-time media? But also, how can I encrypt things? How can I authenticate workloads? But beyond that, we also want to ensure that the latency is really low, because this is real-time. 
We want to be able to fan stuff out to multiple locations, because real time is very often a fan out. But we really want to get the footprint down as well. If you're running this at the edge, if you've got a camera in a coffee shop that's sending a video stream, the computer in that coffee shop isn't a giant rack server. It's going to be something small. So let's get the footprint down. And the way we do that is through the architecture, which I'll come on to. So use cases. Initially, we were looking at anything real time, but we've, as I say, we focused down on RTP, the real time protocol. So we're not looking at things like gaming and finance stock feeds, but we're looking at things like contribution videos, so live TV, looking at the live TV side of how we would then distribute that video out to head ends, caches, et cetera. Also, like I say, the, the retail and industrial edge, things like cameras. I was at Cisco Live in Las Vegas uh, back in June, July. Uh, and what you, you walk into a casino, and the number of cameras that are watching you is absolutely insane. And I cannot believe there's a human watching each of those cameras. So there must be a machine learning infrastructure behind, which we'll come on to. And then there's real-time collaboration, whether it's WebRTC, WebEx, Zoom, whatever. And those are all good use cases. So live video, you have a camera, perhaps your, again, football match example. You've got a bunch of cameras at the stadium. You're streaming high-def video, uncompressed, which is like 12 kilobit, 12 gigabits per second for 4K, I think. Um, you're mixing it. Maybe you're adding on a little strip at the bottom saying what the score is or news from another game, whatever. Um, you want to encode that for the different types of clients. You distribute it out to CDN caches, possibly antennas, cable head ends, et cetera. And then you finally deliver to users, which today over the top is typically Dash, HLS, et cetera. So where do we fit in? Well. Um, So the, oh yes, the, the, uh, let's get to this, yes. So the cloud-based encoders, this is a, a really good use case. So how do we take a video stream that comes in and how do we transcode it into different bit rates, different protection mechanisms? And again, this is where being able to fan it out into a bunch of nodes. Each of those nodes can have multiple workloads that could be doing that transcoding or adding on a, you know, titles or so on. And eventually, we'll want to protect it and then we'll fan out those encrypted streams at the different bit rates, and those go off towards the head ends and towards the caches. When we, when we hit the caches, it's a slightly different issue that we have, which is, firstly, we want to, oh, that's the right one, yeah. So, so the first thing is, if we want to get out to these caches, these caches are out over the internet. We're no longer within one cluster, one cluster of nodes, you know, with a very high bandwidth network between them. We could be out over the internet, Things can fail, you know, links can fail, nodes can fail. So we probably want to do things like send over dual paths so that we know that if one path fails, the other can kick in immediately. We might want to add forward error correction to deal with any bit errors. Um, you know, that sort of thing, we want to be able to add that functionality, but in a way that the infrastructure adds that for you. You shouldn't have to worry when you're setting it up as a developer and programming things, oh, how do I send it two different ways? You want the infrastructure to be able to manage that. And finally, to get to clients, one thing, um, one thing we've looked at is can we actually run real time all the way to the client by running RTP over quick rather than over UDP to get through the firewall issues? That certainly works. Um, but I think what we're seeing is a move within the ITF, so in the standards bodies, towards other, other approaches. So there's a proposal quicker, which came out of Cisco. There's actually a, a larger umbrella now called media over quick, where they're looking at how do we take live media and put it over quick? So certainly watch that for the future of live media. So this is what I referred to with, with things like surveillance cameras. And this is a really good use case um, and probably the first one that we'll deploy. So you've got two, two examples. One is, as I say, the casino example with a you know, vast number of cameras in a casino or a hotel or an airport, whatever it might be, or a convention center. Um, but the other extreme, you might have thousands of retail locations, each with one or two cameras, and you want to bring it into one infrastructure. So the issue is, as I say, humans are expensive relative to computers. So what you want to do, for example, is be able to stream something to a human or to, hopefully it's here, yes. You might have something where you're literally just storing the data or possibly putting it into an ML system. And perhaps the ML system detects that something's gone wrong. And then at that point, you stream it to a human. So it could be just seeing anomalous behavior. I, I don't know if you have it where you guys live, but um, for me, I'm, I'm based in London. I've noticed now some of the, the food chains where you go and buy sushi or whatever, literally you pick up your food, you take it to a machine and you pay. There's no human involved. So I'm guessing they must have some system 
at least trying to verify that I have the same number of things that I'm, I'm paying for. So finally, um, how do we build this? So from a very high level, what we deploy is a bunch of components. We have a control plane that we run one instance for each deployment that we have. Um, we have an emission webhook. This is just to automate everything. The CLI plugin, again, helps with automation. But then the, the applications we deploy, we try and have a very small footprint that we put into each application. So we have a little, a little what we call a sidecar, which is a stub proxy, but very, very small. It's less than 1,000 lines of code. Um, and then, but each node will have a single proxy. And the reason we run one per node is because that's the right place to do fan out. And again, we're getting the right footprint of one control plane overhead for the whole deployment, one data plane per node, and then minimal overhead for each workload. I'll just breeze through this, but basically, yeah, what we want to do is make sure that when we're setting things up, again, we don't want to have to write long files saying, please, can you inject me this sidecar? Can you make it work for me? We want to be able to say to the infrastructure, we're just going to label something, and it, it should just all happen automatically. And this is exactly what you would see in something like the Istio service mesh. And again, we, we want to intercept traffic within our application pod. In order to do that, we need an IP tables rule or an eBPF rule. And again, we don't want to have to do that manually. We want to automate. Whenever we deploy something, that rule gets popped in there. So in terms of the control plane, and this is where it, you know, we really also want, as well as having one control plane per deployment and a data plane per node, the, the other good thing about separation is now we can reuse components. And we can say, all these different protocols use RTP for their data planes. So we can write that once. But then there are all these different control planes. So we have RTSP, we have you know, WebRTC, RIST, SIP, a whole bunch of different control planes. And what we want to do is write each of those separately and use that common data plane. The really nice thing that we have is actually there's a whole ton of libraries out there for this stuff. So again, when we came to write this with RTSP, we didn't write RTSP from scratch. We took an existing open source RTSP library. Our stuff's open source, so really quick you can get out there. And there are libraries for all the other protocols we want, so it should be pretty easy to integrate. And in a cloud-native fashion, everything's API-driven. So we specify APIs between our different components. We model those with protobuffer, and then we use gRPC as the API. But what we do need to do, of course, is talk to the Kubernetes control plane as a DNS, because I don't want to type in a URL that says I'm going to this ephemeral workload somewhere in a cluster. I want to say, well, I'm going to this URL and I want you, the system, to figure out which workload pod is currently exposing that URL. So that's why we integrate there. What we want to do is, is separate even more in the control plane so that we can make it really just a plug-in for the protocol and separate the two concerns we have. One is, how do we run that protocol, RTSP, SIP, whatever. But the other is, how do we take a logical view that says, I'm a sender, perhaps I'm sending to you two receivers, but the physical view is I'm sending, but there's actually one physical node here, one physical node here, and we want to physically deploy that onto the network. So we want to separate all of that out. And again, that just becomes common that we can use it for everything. And the nice thing there, in fact, is that we can even use that outside of this cloud native deployment. So if I, for example, want to deploy an edge proxy that might even be on a customer premise, that can now be controlled through this control plane, and we just figure out what that mapping is. We could even say, well, that customer premise, you're using private IP addresses, but I know what your realm is. I know that that IP address is within this realm that corresponds to this particular customer, and now we can proxy it right down at the customer premise. The stub, as I said, was, oh, you won't get to find out about it. I haven't even hit the time. Hit it? Oh, yes. It's back, it's back. Um, so, Mostly all the stub does is just handle how we separate the control plane from those individual workloads, really to handle failovers and things. We don't want to do things like mirroring TCP session state, because that's really hard. But by moving everything onto gRPC at the stub, we, we get away from that. We can also intercept the data plane if we want to for some use cases. Uh, we can also add on authentication. But as I say, this is really low footprint. I wrote it myself, as I say, in less than 1,000 lines of code. So it's, it's really pretty small. Um, Yes, I so said this is the example where it can intercept data plane. In terms of the data plane, this is just standard RTP. It's an RTP proxy. If you look at the RFC, they call it a translator. The nice thing, if you proxy rather than using NAT, 
is now you get things like unicast to multicast, V4 to V6, private to public, all of that kind of comes for free. Um, it also really nicely minimizes your attack surface because you're just exposing you know, one port for your, well two usually, one for RTP and one for the real-time control protocol, and that's all you're exposing on that node. And so you don't have to worry about other attacks coming in. And in fact, what you can do in that data plane, our prototype today is a very simple one we wrote in Golang, so really quite trivial, but we're moving towards a Rust-based high-performance data plane, but with plug-in filters. The idea being there that, again, from a security point of view, what you might want is a filter that checks your headers to say, not only is this valid RTP, but in fact, is the session ID one that we already know about? So we know this is secure, this isn't unexpected traffic coming from outside to protect against DDoS and that sort of thing. Because again, UDP-based traffic, that's always going to be a concern in that there isn't the handshake. So we need to sort of have that more application layer. Okay, we know about this session. Um, but we also might want to do encryption, that's your path fan out. We might want to add FEC, we might want to do congestion control. And the, the real thing this comes down to is this is open source. And I guess one thing I'd say take away with you is if you're running an open source project, one of the key things is make it easy for people to contribute. So on the control plane, I showed this is how we've built it. Here's this plugin for the protocol. And we want to make that API around the plugin really simple so that people can contribute plugins. On the data plane, we want to make it super, super simple that the, the interface is pretty much here's a packet, send a packet, so that you don't have to know about the rest of my code. You can write that plugin in any language that compiles to Wasm. You write that plugin, it does exactly what you want. We have a very open sort of, you know, there are all these different open source licenses. This is one of the more relaxed ones, so if you want to write your own plugin, you don't have to give it away to everybody else. So you can take this open source project, add a plugin that does exactly what you want for your application. And that, that's absolutely fine. Or if you want, you can contribute one. Um, so typically what we'll do is we just strip off our packet headers, the transport layer. Typically that's UDP based. You can run RTP over Quick or TCP. And then we just run through this programmable filter chain of these little plugins that'll do things like adding error correction, fanning the stream out, adding on encryption, for example, and finally we'll strip it off and send to the clients. So that's really just a very brief overview of the process. I'll skip the demo because we're, we're out of time, but I'll show one tomorrow in my, in my breakout talk. I think that the key thing to say is that you know, the goal here is if you're deploying real-time apps, typically today those haven't moved into this cloud native ecosystem. We want to help them move into it and be, as we say, first-class citizens. But it's very much work in progress. It's open source, so you can go onto GitHub and look at the code. We, we have a website. Um, I'm really asking for people to help. So if you want to deploy it, come talk to me. If you're a coder and you, you want to come code on this, come talk to me. I know it's a small audience, but hopefully um, it's fun stuff to work on. And the nice thing is this is you know, net new. I don't know of anyone else doing this in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So it's something fun to work on that actually I think will provide a capability that will really help that whole media world. And certainly when I talk to people in the media world, they get excited by this because they know they want to move into cloud native, but right now, today, they can't do it. So let's, let's help them do that. So thanks very much. I think I have like one minute if anyone wants to ask a question. And Gary, you came with a question, didn't you? My breakout session, good reminder. I said that at the, at the beginning before you came, but never hurts to say it again. So it's 1.30 tomorrow if I'm getting my, my time right. So um, in fact, I can even give you the room number. How about that? Um, it is going to be. Uh, See, it's not at 3.30. See, I'm getting my, there you go. I'm adjusting my time zones wrong. So it's 3.30 tomorrow, and it's in G102. And so that will be a full-length breakout. And I will even, as I say, show a demo of this stuff running. Um, and it, yeah, come have a look and, and see what you think.